Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. When we think of the fighter pilot, the image that pops straight into our head is usually a character from one of our favorite movies, whether it's Maverick from Top Gun or somebody like that. But where does that idea of fighter pilot come from? Where does the popular understanding of these daring knights get codified in the new medium of film? And that can be traced right back to the beginning with Wings in 1927. But before we delve too much more into what we're going to be chatting about today, of course, we've got to do the sponsor bit. So give it all up for the fabulous team at 909 Apparel. If you've seen me in the real world, you will know that I love a great aviation theme t-shirt and hoodie. Yet finding decent quality ones has been more of a difficult process than I would have hoped for. That is, of course, until I found the fab 909 Apparel. Named after the famed B-17 Flying Fortress, which flew 140 missions without losing a crew member, 909 Apparel's designs celebrate the history and heritage of aviation, which is something I can totally get behind. Each design can take up to three months of research to complete, so that you know that your passion for aviation is matched by the team at 909. And the great thing is you can get your 909 apparel t-shirt or hoodie just about wherever you are watching this, all through their Amazon shops. So do check out their link tree below to find your local store and get your aviation on. And yes, they do Spitfire ones as well. Check out the link in the description below. So in 1927, we get a film called Wings that stars Clara Bow and two other guys that we're going to be talking about. And it's phenomenal. And it's also the sort of thing that hooks people like me and our guest today, Abby Whitlock, who is a military historian and museum professional who spent a lot of time looking at the First World War ace on film. So today we're going to be basically chatting movies with Abby, but also looking at the development of the pilot and the ace through films like Wings, Howard Hughes's Hell's Angels, the two Dawn Patrol movies, and then we're going to jump to the 70s for the fab Aces High with Malcolm McDowell. So to kick this off, we're going to ask Abby a straightforward question. What came first? Was it the fighter pilots or was it the movies that fighter pilots were in? I suppose we've all been watching these things for a long time, haven't we? Where did the idea to delve into this idea of fighter pilot come from for you? I will have to blame my mother for this one because <laughs> she grew up as a, a Peanuts fanatic. Mm -hmm. I, For the benefit of the yes. video, I'm wearing this, a Peanuts fanatic. And I remember when she showed me It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown when I was younger. And I thought Snoopy's flying ace costume was just a costume. And my mother, she's a retired teacher. She specialized in social studies and she bought me this like hardback set of books on aviation. And I was just fascinated by civil aviation, Earhart, Lindbergh. Mm -hmm. And she bought me this one about the Red Baron. No idea who that was at age eight or nine whenever I got it. And in this book, talking about this mysterious Red Baron, it was talking about Snoopy and how Snoopy co-opted the Red Baron's image <laughs> and, in my opinion, led him down to be the disgrace that is the Red Baron pizza box. So when I was younger, I just became so interested by this mysterious pilot at a time when I didn't know that there was even planes, much less planes with guns. And when I got into middle school and high school, I just started consuming all of these books on First World War Aviation and watching all of these films that my parents had grown up watching. So the Blue Max, Von Richthofen and Brown, Ace is High, Peanuts. So, so you, didn't, you didn't start with the good ones? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. And I, I didn't start with the good ones. And I was like, these are, these are lack of a better word, kind of crap. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then in, in college, my advisor at the time got me start, started on looking at the interwar films. Hmm. So Wings and Hell's Angels and both Dawn Patrols, because most people don't realize there's two. And I just found something really interesting there and kind of like these threads of ways things were portrayed to explore. And then I just fell down the slippery slope of every weekend during college watching 
these old movies on the internet archive and writing pages of notes that I was like, that kept my mind running like a hamster wheel. So I like to blame my mom for creating that monster of consuming all of these aviation movies. <laughs> you know, it's always good to blame your parents for good things because normally they get just the bad stuff. Don't they? <laughs> I doubt that she would think it would lead to 20 some year late years later writing about peanuts and all of these movies that she encouraged me to watch. So I, I, I think we, we could very easily just disappear down that this, this Snoopy flying mm -hmm. stuff. Cause he know, you know, it's it's the thing that always sticks in my head is he never achieves anything. He always gets shot down. He, he's always the sort of the the fodder, and I think that's why I love it so much because it's you know it's not Snoopy pretending to be this great thing. He's still got all of the life weighing yeah. down on him. And yeah, and that's what's interesting is after I've consumed all of these films, not to just be the peanut supporter that I am, but it's one of the most accurate portrayals of the ace mm -hmm. i mean he has this hatred but also this admiration for his enemy and then he comes home and cries while schroeder is playing at the piano and when you read <laughs> all of these memoirs from pilots that is not far off from being very accurate <laughs> he they play one song and then he's a sobbing mess <laughs> on schroeder's <laughs> piano and i always like to say that that's my favorite and most accurate portrayal of the ace. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm regretting not spending more time on it now. <laughs> well, all, er, yeah, Clara Bow and Errol, Errol Flynn, um, yeah, Basil Rathbone, all those sorts of guys, Malcolm McDowell, but no, we should really be talking about Charles Schultz and Snoopy, <laughs> but that, that, to be fair, let's save that. You can, if, if you want to, you can come back and we can just do a whole, whole thing on, on Snoopy. I'd love that. Um, yeah, oh, man. There's there's always a point when when I do these things, and I just sort of look at look at all the the hard blood, sweat, and tears that goes into the prep, and go, "Damn it, that was the obvious one. Why didn't we do that?" <laughs> I the Peanuts fandom are like staunch defenders of Schultz in the Snoopy image, so I don't want to open a can of worms by delving into <laughs> Snoopy's trauma and not being his best alter ego. So I'm happy to leave that where it is. <laughs> I just making it sound even more fascinating now. <laughs> oh dear. Right. Well let's let's delve into this. So this all came about from your your fantastical fantastical? Fantastic article in, in, in Epoch about the sort of the man's world that we've gotten so used to seeing. And we've had a whole space of aviation movies. And of course, by the time this goes out, we're a week away from Masters of the Air, which we won't talk about because <laughs> I've said I won't until next week to the nice people at Apple. But let's delve into this. How have you framed it? Because I thought it was a very interesting way to sort of look at it from a few different groupings of, I don't want to say approach, but viewpoint, isn't it? It's it's that sort of, you, you've sort of have it as group culture, attraction, sexuality, recklessness and danger, and then that bravery and trauma Venn diagram sort of element. So... Let's break that down so people can understand what we start ch chatting about when we get into the movies. What is your framing for this and how did you come up with it? So, of course, you know, now recording this in 2024, it's coming up on 100 years of aviation movies and aviation movies exploring the First World War Ace. You know, you're barely 10 years out from the First World War and the first ones are being made. And that's a, that's a long time. That's a lot of different periods and genres and approaches to making films, but also cultural viewpoints on masculinity and emotion mm -hmm. and things like that. And when I was approaching these films initially in my research, I wanted to be careful not to pigeonhole it into my 21st century American way of understanding these films. So kind of applying hindsight in my viewpoints to this to be like, well, yes, of course, that is somebody like Errol Flynn's character suffering. Of course, he's going to suffer. It's the First World War. But when I kind of that light bulb clicked in my mind that that's 100 years of different cultural context, there are still kind of core elements to this, what is a flying ace as a character on film that I can see in every depiction, regardless of it being 
I hate to give it a shout out, Fly Boys in 2006 versus you, see there, you, you went and did it there. Yeah. Uh, versus Wings in 1927. So nearly a hundred years apart, there are still these core things that might be different that you can apply to the Ace. And I wanted to kind of see how I could group that. And the Flying Ace, uh, these groupings you can apply, I realized. So the Flying Ace as a historical person, so people like James McCutton and the Rick Toffin brothers, but also that you can apply to these fictional characters on film and find those threads between each. So I didn't know if you wanted me to go into those different groupings briefly. Let's delve into it because I, th I think that's that's going to be an interesting frame because we will be talking about all of these things at the same time. So what are those framings? So th the first one that really came to mind on the obvious forefront was group culture because I think the flying ace is kind of like a singular description. And I feel like people can, can forget when reading about the flying ace, an individual that has earned that title of ace based upon their performance in combat. So baseline, you get five kills, you're an ace now. And I feel like people can forget that these individuals are a part of a group regardless of how they interact with said group is a whole nother thing we can delve into. But the Royal Flying Corps or just these squadrons in general are a group space. And in most of these films and then their predecessors, how pilots describe their experience, one of their first worries is what is my place within the squadron? So what is my place in the squadron as a flight leader? What is my place in the squadron as you know the person that tells jokes in the mess the you know the jokester or what is my place in the squadron as somebody that doesn't believe in everything else that people might believe here so for instance like we'll talk about it later with aces high i think that has such a, a an interesting look at group culture so that was the one that came to my mind first was obviously these are individuals within a group setting Regardless of if they're alone crying in their room, as we see with somebody like Hollister, that is still a group space and that is still a group interaction. And then I guess the second one is perhaps the one that people think of the most when they think of the flying ace on film is that attraction, sexuality and romance, you know, the womanizer, you know, the pilot that has five or six girlfriends at a time and gets their names mixed up. And that was the one that was the most interesting to me when I was trying to compare it to reality for pilots is are pilots in the first world war actually acting like that or is that something they also aspire to be that has been projected onto them by the public and that's a whole that's a whole nother podcast you know this oh, knights yeah. of the air image um so why is that amped up so much on film when it might be slightly more lacking in the letters um and then recklessness and danger, of course, that leads to that, you know, it's the reckless womanizer. It's the person that comes in from the patrol all on his face and is just ready to go back out again. It's something that's attractive there. You know, is that attractive mm -hmm. to men? Is that attractive to women? Is it attractive to both? Is it meant to be attractive to both? And then so spitting, the spitting in the eye of danger sort of thing. Yeah, throwing caution to the wind and being that reckless, brave, dashing youth that most pilots were. Um, and then the one that I find most interesting, particularly in this set of films that we will discuss, is kind of the place of emotion in the pilot's life. And I feel like that is where you see the most direct correlation between the realistic kind of experience of the flying ace that we see in like Arthur Gold Lee's writings, Cecil Lewis's writings, even Rick Toffin's writings, and these films. These films bring to life what we are reading in Mick Mannock's diary, which is one of the darkest things you could possibly read uh, as a First World War historian. But you see kind of the most direct correlation there. Um, and I think the least amount of sensationalization and kind of romanticization. Um, you see that most direct correlation. And that was primarily a way for myself to kind of understand these films and the cultural context and its kind of reflection on the war, but then also trying to make it make sense to somebody that might not be able to watch all these films. Because mm -hmm. let's be honest, 
how many people want to sit down and watch a hour long plus silent film with varying soundtracks that you might be able to find on YouTube, even though Wings, I highly recommend it. How, um, how can you not? It's, it's fantastic. I know. And when a few years ago, I had the privilege of seeing it at the AFI Theater in Silver Spring, Maryland with a live mm. band. And it was really kind of understanding that experience that you would have had in the 20s. But I wanted to have a way for somebody to understand it, whether they're an avid film viewer, a historian, um, you know, a film historian. And I, I didn't want to boil it down too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think that's, that's a great way of, of looking at it. It's, it's sort of what made me really want to, to chat with you was mm -hmm. that is an accessible way to start looking beyond the spectacle that, that all of these films that we're going to have. And, mm -hmm. I think that the other thing that you, you make clear is, you know, it's only nine years, less than that when they start making Wings, that they start telling this mm -hmm. epic tale of, of fighter pilots in the air. And what was interesting going back to watch it after so long, was say how much I remember it, because it's been a while, mm -hmm. be that it's really good. And Clara Bow is the best thing in it. Let's just, we just, yeah, the flying is good, but Clara Bow, every moment she's on screen, you're just like, yeah, more, more, of, more of her, please. But when you start applying your trained eye to these sorts of things, what do you start seeing in Wings? What is it, you know, I called it melodrama plus at times, because mm -hmm. it, it, it is, but there's a lot of things that we see in Wings, which, you know, transpose almost down to, say, the modern stuff like Top Gun and, and devotion things that the you know the the two pilots there's yeah a master and apprentice if we bring in another film even that one in their flying sequences i'll have that as well you can get me going on <laughs> luke and his mate who gets killed but there's always this this sort of dichotomy of, of people how does wings sort of set that template i think the strongest thing that wings does is build off of that immediacy i mean like you say it is nine years after the fact and when you go back and read kind of vanity fair articles and reviews of the film a lot of the cast and crew outside of richard arlen charles buddy rogers were veterans from the war and a lot of them were over in europe flying in some capacity so i think building off of that immediacy and something that is recognizable even though everyone might not have been a pilot at that time it's something people recognize and they would have seen in newspapers, they would have seen in newsreels coming in. And you could go to the to the cinema and be like, okay, I, I can understand what's going on here. And at least in my opinion, you can disagree with me here, it has kind of the lowest level of sensationalization out of most of these films outside of the Dawn Patrol. I mean, of course, they amp up the tension between Jack and David, but what film does it? They're 20 year old boys. They're going to fight. But there isn't there isn't a lot of melodrama beyond the the romance mm -hmm. in it. And I think. Other than that immediacy, choosing to explore the duo rather than a wider group of people. Makes it a cohesive focus storyline because it is still group culture in a way, if you look mm -hmm. at it. They are a duo within a squadron. If the duo was fighting, it can leak out in the squadron life beyond their little 20-year-old boy fight. You know, it can bleed out if their emotions are in turmoil. It can, it can leak. And I think having a smaller cast of characters to explore in Wings is what makes it so strong. You get attached to people. And even though there's no audible dialogue, you, you get attached to these characters, but they don't feel like characters. And I rewatched it before joining today, and I'm just struck by how much they seem like a group of friends. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like acting, which is a lot to say for silent film acting, which can turn off a lot of people. It feels like you were kind of being an outsider watching this group of friends have this this up and down motion within the war and when you read rural flying corps literature or german first world war aviation literature that's what you realize is that 
these squadrons ultimately become groups of friends, you know, first and foremost. When they finish a patrol, they go and are playing ping pong or drinking or just reading books and sharing, kind of having like a weird little book club within squadron messes. And I think that's what Wings does next to the Dawn Patrol, which I will argue later. <laughs> it, it shows like the human side the best. It shows the up and downs without being too focused on the negative aspects of them fighting or being too patriotic or positive or rose-colored lenses. And that's what I really like about it. And like you said, Clara Bow is the star of that. She's very human. She, she is, yeah. She's Clara Bow. <laughs> you, you can you can see why she was as big a star as she was because she just is. I, I always think of um, Marilyn Monroe and All About Eve. She's in that one scene sitting on the stairs, and mm -hmm. it the camera can't leave her. It's the same thing with Clara Bow. Is she just fills the screen with with those eyes and and, and that smile and things. But the, the the thing that struck me about going back to Wings as well was. It set a template that we still see today, that we see very closely in the two Dawn Patrol films, mm -hmm. and to a degree, Hell's Angels, because you can see Hughes trying not to do it, but he kind of ends up doing it again. We're going to get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the, the thing that always struck me as well is we remember Wings for a lot of the technical achievement, the tracking shot through the, the restaurant, the, yeah. um, the people that we see through that very pre-code as well. Um, but it's also highly moralistic because he, you know, he gets home and and Jack sort of cut up for. I'm going to spoil a hundred year old movie here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, Jack kills David by accident, but it's the regrets, but also the moralizing when he he talks to Mary as well. There was this girl in Paris, of course. There's always a girl in Paris, my dear chap. But I think I think that's as as you pointed out. It, it's this thing that it covers so much, and yet it does it in a way that is quite sensitive to the characters throughout it. They each have their arc. They each have something that draws you into them. And, you know, even the five minute Gary Cooper's on screen and you know, he's going to die as soon as he shows up. He's not Gary Cooper yet, ladies and gentlemen, he's pre Gary Cooper, Gary Cooper, but yeah, you know, it's that character who shows up and he's like, right boys, I'm going up. Yeah. And then smoke dies. Me. Yeah. Smoke me a kipper. I'll be back in 10 minutes. No, you won't. Um, it, it has all of those things. It, that is just absolutely fantastic. And we, we don't even, you know, the flying scenes have, have, re have rarely been touched. Yes, the airplanes are wrong and, you know, people can complain about that. And it's clearly Southern California. But other than that, it's, 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 it's perfect. I love it. Yeah, every time, because, you know, this, this film was an oddity out of all of the ones that we'll discuss by being a silent film. I think it just has such a powerful impact by somebody like Clara Bow being able to portray such emotion with a look. Mm -hmm. And I, I just adore this movie. And you, you touched on a point about that kind of survivor's guilt aspect that Jack has that I, I feel like is the strongest out of all of the films in that have been around in the past hundred years because it's, I like how short it is and for it to be an interaction with the parents and be more focused because with a lot of other films, somebody passes and then they're reminded holding like one of their personal effects. And it kind of brings forth this wave of emotion being like, why me? But having Jack return home to his small town and face his David's parents, which is something he knows is going to happen is something that, particularly being 1927, most men in that audience, particularly in the United Kingdom, I would say, when this is screened, would have had that experience. Whether it was just a friend that they made in the trenches for a short period of time or in these squadrons, or it was their best friend in the case of Jack and David. That is something that the people in the audience would recognize and almost sympathize with and kind of mm -hmm. see themselves in these characters. And I think that goes back to this film not being very sensationalized. It's a very applicable experience. And I'll talk about Clara Bow's experience in a second. But it's a very applicable and it, I hate to say attainable experience. 
but it's something that somebody watching it in rural Kansas or New York City or London and be like, I understand. I understand what they're going through. And I feel like that ties into people feeling attracted to these flying aces on screen. Because even if they are not, they weren't aces themselves or pilots themselves, they see elements of themselves in these people. And I just have to point out, I love the blink and you miss it, head a hopper moment when as jack's mom as she's heading off you just like hang on yes that is the infamous soon to be infamous as a hopper googler ladies and gentlemen if you, you don't know but that's something let's get back to clara because let's be fair we could just talk about her for the next hour and i'd be quite happy <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting because we'll of course we'll talk about hell's angels which i feel like has the complete opposite mm. exploration of the woman's experience but what I think draws myself and other people to wings is the heavy focus on the female experience in the war and also this man's world of pilots and flying aces where they could have easily not have had a Claire Bow character and had, I think her name is Sylvia, the, the, the girl next door that they like. Mm -hmm. um, they could have easily cut out Claire Bow having this autonomy and authority in the film. And I, I think what draws so many people to it is she takes up quite a lot of time in the movie and in the plot. She has a very solid part in the plot that without her wouldn't be as interesting as it is. And you have to talk about the Paris scene when she's going to track down Jack. <laughs> and it, where he's drunk, again, spoilers, she's there he's very drunk and she's trying to talk with him as he's at the height of his career at being this, I think he's called the shooting star ace. And as you know, he's at the top riding the wave and this girl from his hometown is coming and trying to explain to him, I'm here. <laughs> I've essentially followed you here. And she gave, she gave him his name. She, she gave him his the name. shooter's name on the car and yeah, shooting star. He's not shooting there. Yeah. And he just doesn't give her the time of day, no recognition, no acknowledgement. He's so drunk. And having that scene with her and the military police interact and seeing her face that level of guess punishment is the right term because she's sent home and showing that very raw, realistic, female experience to where th they kind of edge on making her a sex symbol in this movie by having the brief glimpse of nudity that, that we have a clear mm. bow, but they kind of rip that rug out from under her and don't let her have that moment. And I think it shows the best way of women trying to break into this man's field that the first world war kind of gives women the opportunity to, and then we see women kick the door down in the second world war much to men's dismay. And I think she's the strongest character in the movie, which as a First World War aviation film, you're just taken aback. She's not hanging off somebody's arm or, you know, trying to break apart friends. It's the complete opposite. She likes David. Jack likes her. And she's like, well, I'm not going to turn down Charles Buddy Rogers, for God's sake. It's, <laughs> it, uh, she's just a very interesting character because she very much controls her own life and faces kind of roadblocks for that. Whereas with other films like with Hell's Angels, and I'll be brief about it, they're very overtly sexual and objects of men's desire. And they seem to have a better life because of that. You know, they don't face as many roadblocks. And I just, out of all of these first world war aviation films, she is my favorite female character and there aren't many granted. Yeah. She is the strongest. And for that to be coming out in 1927 is just mind blowing. I, I, I think again, having gone back to after a long time, the interesting thing with Jean Harlow in hell's angels is how independent a character she is in it. You know, she, is quite literally doing whatever she, she wants throughout it. And and there isn't, to my watching, there's not a lot of judgment for her. She just is who she is. And you have the two brothers 
with the very different approaches towards it. And I think that's interesting, but it also, as you're saying, moves the female character away from being central to the arc of the story, to be the disruptor, the thing yeah. slightly off center that's causing tension and problems. Is this where we start really seeing that fighter pilot as womanizer coming in? Um, is it Howard Hughes's fault is basically what I'm trying to say. I mean, I despise Howard Hughes as a human being. <laughs> so I'm always open to placing the blame on Howard Hughes. But I think the pre-code nature really comes into play here to where there is that exploration of overt sexuality, albeit on a very different level than what we see today, what you can go into the cinema and see. But I mean, for goodness sake, they put her in non-period accurate evening attire with these plunging necklines in, in borderline strapless gowns to be on the arm of two men in a public setting. And well, it's Gene Harlow. You can't it's Gene Harlow. To the... <laughs> it's, I, I will admit, it is a very difficult film to watch as a woman and see how not only how much of an overtly sexual center she is to the film, but how she chooses to use that to purposefully break people apart. Mm. I think going back to Clara Bow's character, and I realize I haven't called her by her character's name, Mary. <laughs> um, she doesn't. It's it's, it's Clara. Come on. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> she doesn't. She doesn't choose to break people apart. You know, as a woman, she naturally kind of comes between people and and causes strife again between two twenty-something-year-old men. If there's a woman in the picture, it's going to happen. Mm. But. With Jean Harlow's, what's so frustrating to watch is it's purposeful. You know, she's depicted purposefully as being this cause, breaking apart otherwise very strong best friends. I would argue even more than Jack and David, who go from this, like, enemies to best friends, track and wings. They're brothers, aren't they? Yeah, team, they're best, team. but they're best yeah. friends. They're mates, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, 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 quite right. I understand what you're saying. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm being overly literal. I apologize. No, no, no you're good. <laughs> but I, it, it's very frustrating. And I, I would say that this is that start of the pilot as the womanizer. Um, hmm. And wanting them to be this person that, or this object that's always pursuing that as a, self, a form of fulfillment. You know, when they're not flying and shooting down Germans left and right, they need another sense of fulfillment and having that other side of individual pursuit. And I would argue that is where they're trying to distance themselves from that group dynamic of the aerodrome is by having that very individual, lack of a better term, hunt to find a woman that is attracted to them for being a pilot. And... I mean, from the opening scene in Hell's Angels, you have a cheating scandal <laughs> open it. Whereas, you know, Wings, it's opened by, the, you know, the bright eyed, you know, girl next door seeing these two boys from her hometown. And less than, what, three years later, it goes from that to a cheating scandal opening up what's supposed to be a war film. Mm -hmm. And a scandal that then... I don't know if we do spoilers, ultimately leads to the conclusion of the film, makes a full circle. Which I don't know. It, 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 there's bits of Hell's Angels that I thought, oh, that, yeah, okay. I'm getting into this now. And then there's other bits, like the whole last 20 minutes where you're just thinking, this is very, very stupid. E even, even for, I, I don't want to say films of the times, but to, to a modern to a modern watcher, it's very on the nose, and you get to that whole thing with films in the thirties that if you do something wrong at some point, your comeuppance will come towards mm -hmm. the end. Something that the code then codifies. Um, what four years later? Yeah, nineteen thirty three, thirty four. Yeah. So it, it, it's it's interesting that it's almost foreshadowing what is to come, and at this because you, you know you take Gene Harlow out of that film, and it's a pretty standard. I, men at war sort of thing you just throw her yeah. in and it it makes it well to be fair that's basically every howard hughes film isn't it it's, it's it's pretty basic but there's just a beautiful woman in the middle of it yeah and I, the the film is visually stunning mm. i mean for it to be 1930 there's these very 
beautiful shots. I'm thinking of the duel that they have with, um, his name is escaping me, but the duel that they then, then put a tent over. And mm-hmm. it's very almost film noir, you know, some film student would have it hanging up in his office and be like, this is the pinnacle of cinema because it's Howard Hughes. <laughs> it's a very stunning film. And without Gene Harlow, it's taking that step towards what Dawn Patrol succeeds at, where it is that exploration of individuals struggling in a group setting. And the two brothers, even without Gene Harlow's character, you see their decline due to how they're experiencing and reacting to their environment mm-hmm. in aerial combat, which compared to films like, you know, All Quiet on the Western Front and things like that and West Front that come out, aerial combat is even newer and more of a shock to the system than in, like industrial trench warfare. We didn't even know the effects that flying would have on the body at all and that's again a whole nother thing to discuss and i feel like compared to wings it is taking another step forward and looking at the the flying aces experience by seeing how they are reacting to and perceiving their environment without gene harlow sometimes they want to go into the plot and shove her out the way and be like let them cry on each other's shoulder and see how they react to that because that is very important of how they are showing or repressing their emotions and particularly as brothers, they should be able to openly do that. But they can't because there is that you are a pilot, you know, this f- myth of the flying ace, the superhuman, the knights of the air, where you're supposed to be calm, cool, collected, stiff upper lip and just get on with your way. As Arthur Goldley, you know, famously says in, in No Parachute, you just keep going. Mm-hmm. And it's just frustrating how much it is overshadowed. She's going to come back and haunt me, but like overshadowed by Jean Harlow. It's just, it's frustrating. There's so much there that could have been, that is just, the plot is so choppy where they just throw the romance back in it and it's disjointed. How it is. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's strange because James Whale writes the dialogue for it, mm-hmm. gets paid, goes off and makes Journey's End, mm-hmm. which is that, the first adaptation of Journey's End, we should say, because it's Sheriff puts it on in, in London 27, mm-hmm. I want to say. It's yes. Laurence Olivier's big break, all, all, all of that that sort of thing. And he, but he's able to go out, write it, make it, and get it out before Howard Hughes does as well. And then at the same time, Zanuck is producing the first version of Dawn Patrol, mm-hmm. which we're not going to spend too much time on because... I like David Niven. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to crack on. But it's interesting to see just how different those movies are because we get immediately to that men in a situation style film. There's no women at all in any of the Dawn Patrols, either of the Dawn Patrols even. And it's interesting how in this short space of time, about three years, we've gone from Clara Bow leading a mm-hmm. World War One fighter pilot movie, Gene Harlow trying to steal a World War One fighter pilot movie, to it being two guys trying to stay sober in in a shack in in, in France, which is essentially what what Don Patrol is until until the end. Mm-hmm. From from your point of view and, and your your four your your groupings there, how, how is how has this journey happened? Because it's it's interesting. Is it, I, I don't know, is it the things like Journey's End coming out in which it's just putting those people in a, in a bad situation and having them deal? Because you have that sort of interesting thing with the, the, the captain who, who leaves and they all get promoted. And stress falls from upon high. I think the question about Journey's End is an interesting one. Because I feel like if you ask a First World War historian and then you ask an English major... And then you ask just a normal person, you all have different perspectives. I absolutely Mm. adore Journey's End. Mm. It's a wonderful piece of literature. I feel like I'm going to be crucified by (laughs) former advisors for this, but I think it is the best 
piece of literature to come out. Oh, of you war. use the you use the B word already. I use Goodness. the B word. <laughs> it's for a play to achieve that is a big deal hmm. without having the benefits of you know. I'll call them out. Cecil Lewis and Sagittarius Rising having three pages to explain flying over a cloud. Love the man. Hmm. But anyway, I I feel like we don't truly understand the impact that Journey's End had and the period it came out. I feel like the the late 20s is an interesting period because there's just enough distance from the war that people are starting to be like, okay, it's time to get on with my life. You know, rebuild my life before the before you know wall street happens mm -hmm. <laughs> two years later but I, and then getting into the doomed sense of dread that you get with the dawn patrol era as another war is looming i feel like journeys End comes at a time where it's a period of reflection and realistic expectations without that kind of like fresh salt in the wounds pain that comes from the writings in the immediate years following the war where it's like, I want to get my anger out on this page mm -hmm. versus I want to apply my experiences in the first world war to what might be another war happening that you kind of see in that era of, you know, the Dawn Patrol because the book market for first world war related topics. And this time is a fascinating subject. So I think journeys end by focusing on kind of a small cast is a very applicable story. One that we do see with Hell's Angels to an extent, but really with the Dawn Patrol. Because what I like is it shows the impact that war has on the individual. That, you know, it can be ups and downs. It's not just a straight line of, you know, Oh, you started out a very positive person and then you just crash and burn the second you have the slightest trauma. You know, it can be this this up and down. And I feel like that is that was a a story and a that was applied inapplicable. And I, I feel like I, I haven't been able to watch James Wales's film on Journey's End because it's pretty difficult to find in the US, I will admit. Have you seen it? I have seen it not recently. Mm -hmm. I I I went through a stage where whenever Journey's End was being put on here in London, I'd go see it. So I got to see Sam West as Stanhope in the pub mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. North London. It was, he was amazing. Um, Sam, if you're listening, you're always welcome on the pod. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's I've 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 seen it um, on stage many times, and the Wales one was sort of on TV, and I had it on the old uh, TiVo thing for for a while. It's it's very James Whale. Mm -hmm. So if you've seen the, even if we, we, we look at the Frankenstein movies, the dialogue in those films and the staging of them is quite arch, mm -hmm. to, to use, yeah, there you go, going film studies on you. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's not, again, it's very much of its time. They're still figuring a lot of things out. So, it's drawing for people. It's a lot better than the new one. I can say that Aww. quite easily. The new one's pants. I went to the premiere of that, and it, I, it was it wasn't good, mind yeah. you. I did I did run out of that right when it ended, and then got to see Blade of the Mortal, which was Tiashe Mike's crazy samurai movie. So that made me a lot happier than <laughs> the new Journey's End. But that's another story, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I think the the strength that Journey's End has for this kind of interwar period that we see. In, in First World War films in general, but particularly aviation films, is that human relationship exploration. Yes. And particularly with pre-existing friendships, because I feel as if there has been much done about, you know, you come and find your people when you join the military. You know, that's a trope that we see from ancient you know history focused war movies to the present day you find your people in the face of this common cause but what i really like about journeys End is exploring that element of bringing your past life into your current life and if there is a place that it can exist which you know we'll, we can talk about when we get to aces high 
But I feel like you do see elements of that in the Dawn Patrol by, and not so much with Hell's Angels, because I feel like the bromance plot <laughs> kind of pl- has the decline on it, where, whereas it's it's not the war itself that causes them to, to break down and ultimately be separated for life. Not giving spoilers, but it's the romance. But Hell's Angel, uh, Dawn Patrol, excuse me, it's really about human interactions and that's what i absolutely adore about that movie that you first see in wings the dawn patrol while it has amazing flying scenes that are primarily recycled from the 1930 version the the best scenes in that movie are in the mess where they are sitting there drinking laughing or not laughing, in the case of Hollister, my favorite black sheep in the family character to ever exist. But (laughs) it's all about people and how they perceive each other and interact with each other and feeling alienated in this group space. And that ties back into that element of group culture that is so important to the identity of the Royal Flying Corps and the pilot is, where is my place? And can that change? And what changes that? I mean, you see that with Courtney who starts out as being this centerpiece crux to the squadron, and ultimately near the end, he's hated. All within a span of, it's like a dubious, I I don't think they even clarify how long of a period of time it is. It's probably an unrealistic period of time. It's in the film, it's a cut. Yeah. Yeah. Basil Rathbone walks out and Errol Flynn's hitting the bottle. It's a bit jarring. Yeah. It's, it, it's just a very realistic look at squadron life. Mm. One of my, I recently completed my master's dissertation and it was on the role of physical space on aerodromes and how that was important mm. to identity as a squadron and identity as a pilot. Cause it was a space that you could control emotion ultimately. Mm. And one of my favorite things about the Dawn Patrol is how physical space is portrayed. It is the center of most scenes outside of the flying scenes even when they land they're outside of the hangar as the mechanics scurry around in the background talking to each other there are very few scenes of them on their own and even when they are it's them mulling over what have i done or i'm sending people to their deaths but it's always people in a group setting and that is a very realistic portrayal of life on aerodromes in the first world war your commanding officer didn't want you to be by yourself because that's when the dark thoughts start swirling swirling around and you suddenly have an individual brain rather than buying into collective ideas you were always in the mess or in the annex or playing sports and if you weren't you were on a patrol and i think that's what the dawn patrol does so well is just looking at people and how they interact and just showing that natural progression within a tumultuous environment like war and how it's a state of flux and you don't have a control over it. And I think that's what it does so well in this kind of spectrum up until this point. Wings kind of started with it, with kind of that you know downfall between friends and a war environment with kind of romance on the side. But by not having an external force kind of influencing how these people are interacting beyond, you know, vague references to women that are kind of like an offhand thing of, oh, we bonded over such and such crashing into a house and seeing a woman in the bathtub. It's themselves that kind of are the source of trauma. And I think that's what this film does so well for it being nearly 90 years old. Mm -hmm. It's just it's one of my favorite films overall for the casting. I mean, you have Errol Flynn and David Niven interacting, and they just have such natural chemistry. It doesn't feel like acting. Let's be fair, they had a lot of chemistry. If, they if, did have a lot if, of if, if, if the tales are to be believed. They did, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, and I feel like Errol Flynn, you know, it's kind of like t- tapping into Gary Cooper. Errol Flynn had that look. Oh, goodness, yeah. It, it's like he was typecast to be the pilot. You have the little mustache. You have the old back hair. If you look at pilots of the period from the First World War, he has a spitting image. And it's just a very... I just love the film 
for the chemistry. It's you believe that they hate each other and are threatening to throw punches on the set because it doesn't feel like a set. Whereas Hell, um, with Hell's Angels, you can tell it's a set. Yeah. And yeah, that I just I think on the spectrum, Hell's Angels is the weakest portrayal, and Dawn Patrol is the strongest. And what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I know how you have thoughts about Dawn Patrol. I, I do, and they're almost all positive. So there mm-hmm. we go. So we're, we're at the way. It, it, it's a film that you don't expect to hit you in the way it does. And I, and I think that's to the credit of everybody um, involved in it. And, you know, it's it's a retread. It's a remake. It's one of those things of the period of the time. They're like, well, what did we make a few years mm-hmm. ago that we can do again? It, it's that pull it off the shelf, get a bunch of contract people together and do it. And it's one of those things because isn't Errol Flynn and Basil Rathbone go from this to making Robin Hood or something like that? It, it's, it's yeah, it's the trajectory. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's 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 strange how all these things come together. But in this, the thing that just struck me as well that you said with space mm-hmm. is you tend to always see the mess from the same shot and everybody is gathered together on the right hand side. And then the boss's office is off to the right with the stairs in the middle. And as the camera pans, there's less and less people as you get closer to the CO's office. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's very interesting way of framing and of course it's it's classic film film language as you're pointing out as well with space and things that that i hadn't really tweaked until you noticed i was replaying it in my head i adore this movie we're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the pima air and space museum with head of collections andrew bowley here we are again at the pima air and space museum Um, we are inside one of our exhibits that we call the bing so you might ask what is the bing so during operation enduring freedom the early first couple years of A-10 operations in Afghanistan. One of the first units uh, built uh, one of those temporary structures that were all over the place. I think they're called bee huts, if I recall correctly. And they turned it into what they called the Bing, which was kind of like a lounge slash clubby area for the A-10 pilots. Why was it called the Bing? Well, it was named after the strip club and the Sopranos. And that's why it was called the Bing, because that was when the Sopranos was going going on and was really popular. The interesting thing is the first unit was very specific that they wanted no televisions, no or, you know, video games, computers, anything. It was a place to kind of, you know, have some drinks, relax, play some music. They left a code of honor saying no televisions, no video games, etc with a photo of the cast of The Sopranos, you know, just threaten them. So what did the next squadron do? Well, they put in a television and started playing video games. So that's what's kind of interesting about the Bing is kind of this interestingly organic kind of thing that happens during the war that just kind of becomes different things and expands as it goes on. So, you know, it was in multiple iterations because A-10s were, you know, in Bagram, Kandahar. So they would take all the stuff off the walls move it down to their next designation and put everything up. Um, a lot of the stuff is just random stuff off of being, it's a lot like a college dorm room. You know, you have your, you know, velvet Elvis artwork um, that looks straight out of a night, you know, 90s college classroom. The, the plaques that you see along the walls with the squadron deployments and everything, those were actually not in the Bing, they were in their ops shack, but they brought all those back. So again, you know, stealing signs, putting them up on the walls. Um, Every time an A-10 pilot did a deployment to Afghanistan, they left one of their name tags or patches on the wall. So if you did more than one, then you left more than one. So some people you'll see multiple ones. Uh, You see some exchange pilots from um, foreign air forces that were flying A-10s. I have to say this was a really fun exhibit to work on because it's a little different than the typical, um, you know, uniforms, flight gear. And talking with the A-10 guys, they were really, really good about sharing information and being kind of open about things, you know. Like the bars had places to hide alcohol because technically they weren't supposed to bring alcohol into Afghanistan. So, you know, they would put have alcohol sent to them in Listerine bottles and stuff like that and then hide them in here. Another interesting thing is um, they had a pink flamingo that whenever they were 
doing stuff like well, drinking or doing whatever they don't want their CEO to know about, they would put a pink flamingo outside the bing just to let the commanding officer know that now would not be a good time to enter the bing. But it's in the guys who, uh, the guys that we worked with on this exhibit were really good and really interesting. And uh, I had a lot of fun doing this exhibit, or we all had a lot of fun doing this exhibit. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. I think there's the arc that the characters go on and the, I guess what we call a MacGuffin now with Donnie showing up and the decision that Court has to make Mm-hmm. with his replacements that is the the thing that fractures everything whereas courtney becoming the co is a bit jarring and it doesn't quite work him having to make those choices that he was railing against before that is quite natural and flynn plays it brilliantly and niven is trying to support his friend but at the same time doesn't want his little brother we're gonna spoil his little brother to die. his little brother dies but you know it 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 90 years old people we can spoil a 90 year old movie that i'm just we're going to keep saying that ace is high or well, if you've yeah everybody dies in that almost yeah you make a, you make a good point like the, the the point about him becoming a ceo doesn't work it's not realistic mm-hmm. there's a track that you take to becoming a, a ceo but i think brands are real Sorry, Bran's a real dick in that scene as well. He is a real dick. He is a real dick. But I think that I think the overall theme here is just that your actions have consequences, and we've touched on that with Hell's Angels. But actions very much have consequences here, and you can explore that with Flynn becoming CEO and alienating his best friend for making choices <laughs> and mm-hmm. choosing to step into this role, Vice Brand that people despise people know the toll that that takes and they might respect somebody as an individual outside of being the CEO, but they do not respect the CEO because of the choices that they are put into. For instance, brand gets a call for them to go on a patrol and they don't have, you know, everybody's exhausted engines and machines are being repaired. And he's like, okay, we'll do it. When he could have easily said, we do not have the manpower currently find somebody else and the strongest point in the film outside of kind of the doomed fatalism arc that is colored by it being 1938 and with our 2024 hindsight we know what comes later that year and then 1939 and 1940 but it's a very dark movie Mm. if you think about it by 1938 standards by exploring that impact that actions have And I've mentioned him briefly in a joking manner, which I will protect this character with all of my being, is Hollister (laughs) Hollister is another very interesting, strong character for the short amount of time that he's in the film. He actively chooses to not act like everybody else and constantly, to be frank, asking people, what the hell are you doing having fun? You're wiping people's names off the chalkboard after they get shot down. And then 20 minutes later, you're drunk and having fun and joking about these things. And then another spoiler, you're inviting the, the German da- the German in that shoots your best friend down and you're joking and having fun with him. And Hollister actively chooses to be an ass to everybody else just for his own morals. He's like, what are you doing? And I feel that's what I really like about the, this film, the set design, but then also the, the, the way that people interact in those space. He's always sitting off to the side. No matter the shot, they are always choosing to show that Hollister is there, but not with anybody else. Nobody offers him a drink. Nobody offers to go sit with him. He chooses to act like that and be questioning and emotional. You know, he cries in Courtney's arms at one point but he's making a choice and people are like I'm not going to meet you in the middle and that's that element of self-preservation that we see with also with Courtney and Scott distancing themselves they're like we were best friends but I can't get behind what you're doing I, I, I agree and I think 
the one problem I have with the Dawn Patrol is the sacrifice at the end. Yes. When Court gets Scotty drunk and then flies a mission for him. Because, yes, he's saving him from death. Mm-hmm. Is he giving him something worse than death and having to put him into that role where he's sending all his friends off to die? And and that's something that I, I've I've often thought about with this film is yes, it, it's it's the impossible decision, it's the catch twenty two. But isn't that a little bit of a cop out for court taking, you know, the the, 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 the pistol into the, the far side of the airfield and doing the honorable thing? That sort of I can't it, it can be seen as him saying, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to fly this mission because I know it's a way out. Or if I come back, I'm going to get kicked out anyway. So every way it's a win-win. Yeah. It's the the last 15 minutes or so of that film were a bit dicey. It's like it unravels Mm. a bit. And I've often wondered to what extent it's because of the source material, you know, John Monk Mm. Saunders short story, notoriously hard to get a copy of. But, you know, it it is trying to be loyal to the source material. But I would have much rather seen a a post-war scene or, you know, a rest of the war scene because it's 1915 of them trying to get past these differences and this bump in the road and their friendship in peacetime. I would have much rather seen that because you see that in Pilate's recollections to where they come into a conflict as friends with somebody differences occur during the war, whether it's tension over, you know, you're my competition with shooting down Germans, or I don't agree with how bloody emotional you're getting in the mess. And then they have to renavigate that in peacetime, whether it's, you don't talk to them at all, or you, you try and are like, okay, we're back in normal life. <laughs> you know, it's not this, artificial kind of environment of wartime where we're forced together for a common cause it's i would have much rather seen that than that sacrifice because that becomes a trope in these films is a sacrifice you know you see it in wings you see it in hell's angels in a way you i'm name dropping it again but you see it in flyboys um it's it, it becomes a trope and it's not needed I I wouldn't I wouldn't give it as high a calling as trope in Flyboys. I just say they're ripping off better films to try to make theirs work. <laughs> yeah, but it it is odd, and and most people that I do talk to are kind of struck by the ending of the Dawn Patrol. They're just kind of like, hmm. oh, this is a bit odd. So even without knowing that historical background, they're like, this is odd, and I feel like it does take away a little bit of that. And I would have much rather seen them trying to navigate with, you know, survivor's guilt, trauma. I would, as a historian, love to see them trying to negotiate pensions with the government <laughs> after the after the war. But I digress. That's not as exciting of an ending. But it is odd. Well, you, you say that. It came up today. Someone someone on Twitter said, what World War II film do you recommend to people? Um, and I first one that always comes to my mind is the best year of our lives, the William Wyler film about them all coming home. Yes. Um, and, you know, I think, I think there's, I think you're absolutely right. There's a case for that longer, longer tale to these things. Um, but I suppose as well, the fatalism of it, that we should point out as well, that the intertitle card at the beginning says it's 1915 when it clearly isn't, but it's no. sort of showing, yeah, we were talking about this the before when we it, it, mm-hmm. i guess it's showing that fatality of they have no way out they're going to be in this for a while yeah that there's always kind of two elements as a bit of a tangent that i see in most of these films if it's about british squadron so the royal flying corps or the later raf it's always some way going to adapt it to be a 56 squadron knockoff as a 50 <laughs> as a 56 squadron historian watching this where it's 59th squadron i'm like come on You're not making it subtle at all. I'm sure Cecil Lewis walked into the theater to watch the Dawn Patrol and he was like, come on. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, the discussion was, we need to change the number. I'll just switch this. Yeah, just switch it. (laughs) You know, it's the anti-Richthofen squadron. It's the anti-Von Mueller squadron, whatever. And then it's always 1915 for some reason, which 1915 is a boring period for aerial combat. Mm -hmm. Very boring. I'm going to, people are going to come after me. No, it, just... it, 
Yeah, it's boring. Yeah. 1916, it gets interesting. 1917 is insane. And 1918 is just numbers. Yeah, just numbers. I would have loved to see this put in bloody April. If this had been set in bloody April, which I guess for the benefit of everybody listening, it was the Royal Flying Corps' highest losses and casualty rates at any point. It was just squadrons were wiped out in a day. And I feel it's the Dawn Patrol could have easily been put in April 1917. It's trying to be the Fokker Scourge, but I'm like, the Fokker Scourge doesn't work. Mm. Just make it bloody April and 56 Squadron, and we'll move on from there. <laughs> it, it's funny you should mention the good old Fokker Eindecker, because it makes a very strange appearance in the last one of these films that we're going to chat about, which, ta- which was made 40 years afterwards. So... Ace is high. I'm going to tell a quick story. It has a special place in my heart because when I moved over from Canada, it was one of the videos I had in our old Canadian VHS that I was allowed to have in my room. I had dodgy record off the telly, piece of cake. I had the um, Ace is high and um, it's gone out of my head. And, and another, those were my plane movies that, that were there. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, first of the few, um, Spitfire. Yes. Right. Yeah. So there, there we go. Now, in this, it is very much we're going to grapple together all the airplanes that are left over from Blue Max, <laughs> Rich Stuffin and Brown, and things like that. And we're going to make a Journey's End aerial film. And I'm going to say something as well. In the history of the flash cut, there are two perfect flash cuts. One is, of course, Shoemaker's cut in Lawrence of Arabia when he blows out the match. The other is when Malcolm McDowell stands up in the school in this and it cuts immediately to him standing up to change the magazine on his Lewis gun and his SE5. Perfect. Yeah, just end the movie there. Yeah, I think to be to some, it probably would be better if, if we end Ace's High there because there's bits of it that don't work. But I really, really like this film and I think it does some interesting things with the journey's end mm-hmm. sort of trope. But does it take all the boxes in your in your quadrants or dear listener there is a face being pulled by our our guest so i'm I'm guessing the answer is no (laughs) every time because it it also holds a special place in my heart it was Mm -hmm. one of the ones i think i I stumbled across it on i'm trying to remember the channel oh turner classic movies Mm. which is a big channel here in the u.s i'm not sure if it's anywhere else outside of the u.s (laughs) It, it always used to be on sort of one of the high sky numbers that was, mm-hmm. always, I think it's still knocking around. Yeah. yeah. I came across it one day, late high school, I believe. And I was watching it and I'm like, it has the guy from Halloween two in it, oh, uh, which at that poor, time, poor Malcolm getting spotted from Halloween two. Goodness. And, and then, <laughs> and then, you know, it's, it's the sound of music and in mm. from there. But at that point, that was all of the association that I had with it. It, every time I revisit this movie, I have a different view on it. And it, it's one of my favorites. I'll just say there, there is a bias. But it's a very complex movie. And I think it's a very 70s movie, if you think about it. Okay, and I feel as if the Journey's End adaptation is both a blessing and a curse to this movie. And that it tries to adapt journey's end too literally which is journey's end is inherently a trench based experience from the way spoilers for people that haven't read a hundred year old play when raleigh raleigh depending on where you're from raleigh (laughs) when raleigh passes he does so in a damp collapsing dugout and that is very much a trench way to go what I think Aces High suffers from is that it tries to adapt a trench experience to an aviation experience. And it, it has some elements because if you watch the opening credits to Aces High, it top bills it being an adaptation of Journey's End. But then a secondary billing is with elements from Sagittarius Rising, which for anyone that hasn't read it, Sagittarius Rising is considered the godlike Bible of First World War aviation. <laughs> it reads like the Bible at some point. It's a very like spiritual, pseudo-religious read. 
And uh, I've never read it. It's it's very flowery. It's very mm-hmm. Cecil Lewis. Uh, Cecil Lewis was best friends with Arthur Reese Davids. He was a classics major, so mm-hmm. you can see the connections there. And I feel as if it had flip flopped. It being a primarily adaptation of Sagittarius Rising, with elements of Journeys, and it would have been much better. Because I feel as if it tries too hard to copy and paste (laughs) the trench experience written in the 1920s to an aviation film produced in the 1970s. And I I, I love Malcolm McDowell. I'm just going to, sir, if you are listening, I absolutely am a major fan. But sometimes it is almost as if it is a filmed play. The acting can sometimes be a bit stage-like, which... That's fine. It's totally fine. It just to me, there's almost a little bit too much melodrama to make the connection to Journey's End, in my opinion. Whereas it could have been it very much its own story. And I, for anybody that hasn't read it, essentially Journey's End and Aces High take place over the week, and it follows a like this set of characters so you have in the original stanhope osborne hibbert raleigh that cast of characters over the course of a week and people die over the course of that week for lack of a better way of describing it and most importantly the close friendship of two characters that pre-existed the war break down due to one's experience with shell shock and i feel as if they could have explored that without just making it Journey's End. I, I don't know how to... I feel like I'm beating Journey's End to death with this, but it just... Those two experiences of the trenches and aviation were not the same. No. And I know exactly what you're saying. I think Journey's End shadow is so huge that mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of other productions can't get out of the way. Um and you, you tend to spot it a lot. I think as structure, mm-hmm. it works well. It gets blown apart, excuse the pun, gets blown apart a bit in this when they say you've got 14 days. And yeah. it, it starts, it's like you've, you're a third of the way into the movie and it suddenly says day two. And you're like, this is going to be okay. long if he's going to last two weeks. But it's, I think it's saving grace is, yes, it's quite staged, but everybody's doing quite good work in it. Peter Fritz is really good. Um, Christopher Plummer is wonderfully detached in only that way that Christopher Plummer can mm-hmm. can do properly. And I think my favorite character in it is someone who I hated as a kid is um, Simon West's pilot yes. who's who, who has neuralgia. But it's that they're putting up with him mm-hmm. not flying mm-hmm. until they can't put up with him not flying anymore. And he finally cracks. I think that's a very interesting point of the film is he's part of the group. He's done his bit. We're just going to give him some time until he can come back. Um, And I think Wes plays it very, very well. Yeah. Ward. Sorry. Simon Ward, not Simon West. Different different actor. Yeah. I think of, I think his character's name is Crawford, if I'm remembering correctly. There's a lot of C Mm. names. (laughs) There is, yeah. And I always think of him and Hollister as an interesting parallel mm, yeah. because Hollister is very vocal about not wanting to fit in, but still gets in his plane and does his job every day. And he's good at it. He might be crying every moment that he's not in his plane, but he's doing a damn good job when he is flying. Crawford, on the other hand, lounges around in the mess all day reading magazines and bullying Peter Firth, for lack of a better a better term. But what I think is interesting is building off of Blue Max and Von Richthofen and Brown, I think what Aces High does a good job of is bringing the First World War Ace back to the forefront. And whereas Blue Max is a frustrating movie, but Blue Max and Von Richthofen and Brown, which are very sensationalized, and very romanticized and kind of embodying elements that we see in Hell's Angels with romance and lack of historical accuracy being at the center, Aces High focuses on reality and kind of how difficult it is to be a pilot at this time. 
And Malcolm McDowell's performance as Gresham is one of my favorites of all time. And I know I mentioned earlier, I'm giving a caveat just so he won't destroy me if he ever hears this, <laughs> but I don't know if it's staged or if it's just very 1970s filmmaking. Hmm. I'm thinking of, you know, a Clockwork Orange, for instance, where, you know, he's in Clockwork Orange, but he does a fantastic job of being detached, but also quite emotional at the same time. I think he's drawing a lot from it in this. It's... I, I, I see that parallel a lot that that sort of character because it's it's the scene in it when he walks into the cafeteria thing in the school and he's, he's there as the prefect and 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 that look i think he's drawing a lot in this one and i absolutely love that they kicked off the movie taking place at eaton mm. and him essentially indoctrinating the next set that are going to replace him or support him his next protégés because that is very much the experience. I, When I was writing my dissertation, I was combing through all of these records that were from Eaton's archives just to get a sense of that public school connection and the Royal Flying Corps, which you cannot deny that there is a strong connection there. But the amount of entries in the school newspapers talking about pilots in particular that are coming, most of them former students, that are coming to give talks two students is just it, it, you can't count them all and you know they they're publishing these pilots photos in the in the school newspapers and they're coming back for for sports days and the 6th of june and, and all of this and i i just absolutely love that they started off the film with that scene because it not only sets the scene of okay firth and mcdowell's characters are connected but then also He's being carted around like a dog and pony show. He has no control over his his own image and how he's portrayed. Because he can barely get a handle on himself emotionally and mentally to just get through the day. And that's, you know, you gave a shout out to Christopher Plummer. He's ultimately everybody's keeper. Mm -hmm. He makes sure Firth doesn't die. <laughs> and is actually not bullied out of the mess like it's, a you know, a college cafeteria and he makes sure Gresham doesn't ultimately kill himself and that he can act like a normal person and it's just a fantastic cast it reminds me a lot of Dawn Patrol in that way that the cast is just very natural when Gresham and, and Croft are going at it it feels realistic it is and I think it, again it comes down to that that right core of, of actors in, in all of, in all of these films and again it, it yeah blink blinking you miss it and there's there's women in this one and to be mm -hmm. fair it's your prerequisite french lady of the night um <laughs> and i i know the whole scene of them going to to the um the house of ill repute but we'll, we'll call it um it's just there to show how quickly he has he um first craft has to grow up and mm -hmm. he has to become a man before he dies because then he shoots somebody down and therefore he is a yeah a, pro a proper fighter pilot. Um, it's all very quick, but I think one of the things with this as well that I think takes away a little bit from it is the cameos. John Gilgood in that opening scene as the headmaster of Eton, I always find myself going, oh, flip, that's John Gilgood. I forgot he was in this. And then it cuts to the scene of them all planning the thing and it's, Trevor Howard and, and Ray Miller from one of my favorite Billy Wilder movies, The Lost Weekend. It, and it, it, it's almost like them. I know it was very much Jack Gold calling in his friends mm -hmm. <laughs> for these things, but there's there's bits of it that sort of draw draw us out. And I think where it's lacking is that it's not almost more journeys end in keeping it in one place. That it's not yeah. in the air or that Dawn Patrol in in the mess. I think that's where it. Mm -hmm. it starts to go because it's trying to do a little bit um too much because it's just i mean there's there's incredible it's like when they're playing snooker with the, the dodgy table and the, there's just little moments in it including the the scene that they completely redo from don patrol with the, the german pilot as well um it has high moments but unfortunately they're they're kind of spread out in the film it's only about 100 minutes but it does feel a little bit longer than that i think what i like in particular about the film that saves it 
and that it is the strongest thing carried over from Journey's End is the lack of coddling that there Mm. is. Uncle is keeping people stable, whether that be Croft or Gresham, but he's not babying them or telling them that things will get better tomorrow. I feel as if that is the one thing that it improves on compared to Dawn Patrol, is that in Dawn Patrol, there's still 1938 perceptions of, you know, mental health and bravery and all of that, where it's essentially, you know, things will get better, you know, we'll get through this, or I'll ignore you wholeheartedly. And you see this when it comes to Simon Ward's character as well. There's no coddling. When people reach a point and they are tired of the way you are acting, they let you know. Yep. Uncle does tell Gresham he needs to get a grip. And he does tell Firth that people will die or things will get dark. And I, I feel as if that is something that it does very well with Journey's End, where you have Stanhope and Raleigh interacting. Stanhope is an ass mm-hmm. to Raleigh, but he does it as a method of protecting him in a way of not making this, you know, beautiful perception of the war. It's I'm going to expose him to everything dark and awful that I had to experience. So he doesn't end up like me. And I wish they had kind of McDowell had delved into that a little bit more of that aspect of, I wish he didn't end up like me, or I hope he doesn't end up like me. I, 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 okay, here we go. Down the pub film debate here. I think what McDowell's doing is trying to humanize Stanhope a little bit more. Yes, I agree. And and because in, in Journey's End, you, you just basically get, as you said, Stanhope the asshole because of everything. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this, even in Journey's End, there's the connection with the the sister, isn't there? And, and, Mm -hmm. and at least we get to see the sister at the beginning of Aces High. Briefly. And she's an a, she's an annoyance to to yeah. Gresham. Interestingly enough, he's like, yeah. "Stop bringing up your sister." <laughs> yeah. And it's, but I, I think there's a lot done really well in this, and I love this film. And I, I know mm-hmm. I've, I sound a bit hard on it, but there's there's so much like there's just little little bits that are a bit too seventies, and yeah. that's probably the the easiest way to to describe it because I, I think Plummer is the standout. Peter Firth does superb work as the sort of naive bright-eyed kid in the middle. I really like Simon Ward. Malcolm McDowell is trying to do a lot in it, and I'm not sure he has the material to work with as the character is written on the page um, to, to do it. But it's it's definitely an interesting culmination of the films that we've been that we've been chatting about. Um, we we yeah, you know, we could go on, we could talk about, you know, volleyball scenes and things like that, but which is again an interesting thing of putting people together in a situation and, and seeing what happens. And again, you can delve into that a lot more. But it's the tropes that kind of are set in stone by wings we still see today. And I was actually thinking about this earlier. The bar scene in the new Top Gun. I'll I'll send the caveat. I haven't watched the new Top Gun because the original has such a special place in my heart. <laughs> have Have you seen Star Wars? A long time ago, yes. Yes, you've seen the new Top Gun. Okay, it's, it's just it, it, it's li- it is literally a new hope. Okay, it's when it dawned on me that's what they were doing. I was like, okay, I'm happy with this. It's fine. Not going. Why have they not got F eighteen Growlers coming in to to jam that why are they doing you know, why are they, you know, why are they using these aircraft yeah it's 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 essentially stars but there's a scene in it where he's at the bar and all the new pilots come in mm-hmm. and they do their thing and you go oh it's jason from the new place and that completely takes you from the, the good place but it again it's that bringing it together in that situation and again that one character off to the side mm-hmm. in tom cruise um in the journey of them all coming together to to be and you know Glenn Powell being full on Glenn Powell, which I'm I'm here for. Um, but it's interesting that we still see these things, and that there hasn't I can't think of anything that's changed the mold for this sort of film for a long time. And you have something like Flyboys, which just doubles down on it all and fails on just about every level because that film should have been about Eugene Skinner, and it would have been better for it. Um, Unfortunately, it's about James Franco being James Franco, and he doesn't die, which 
spoilers. It it, which did, yeah, which which means it didn't make a hundred million dollars. Um, but it, it it's I, I suppose just wrap up that it's through these things and through this sort of setup of these this sort of set of films. I guess we're saying we start seeing a lot of things that we have become very used to. And I suppose the Second World War films as well um, come out. You know, as soon as we get to, we didn't even mention Test Pilot. Mm-hmm. Um, as well, I think which would have been an, an interesting one as well because that had a massive effect on the airmen in in the Second World War. What 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 do you think our takeaway from these films are when we look at the portrayal of a fighter pilot now, the image that all these guys sort of live up to? There's you know a little bit of Chuck Yeager and a little bit of all of these characters that we've seen rehashed for the last hundred years. I think these films are trying to make sense of a very complex individual you know the the even though it's been a hundred years the fighter pilot slash flying ace because i feel as if a lot of these films conflate the two you're not you're not always the same it's a very complex position and one that we still don't truly understand and i feel as if unlike the infantryman or the sailor the difficulty with the flying ace is there was always popular media present when this image was being created. I I hadn't mentioned it yet, but the First World War saw some of the first celebrities being created. Pilots were celebrities. In Germany, you had Sanka cards, which were essentially like bubblegum or baseball cards that you collected of people. And people would trade them and buy it off of each other. And they were celebrities. And I feel I'll, like what, I'll, I'll trade you a, a new debt for your rich and sort of thing. Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll take a, yeah, I'll take a wolf. Um, I think what it's showing is unlike other sorts of imagery or individuals within wartime, there hasn't been a distinction between pre popular media, meaning cinema or mass media with newspapers and the fighter pilot. And I feel as if that had a major impact on how we perceived the fire pilot, because it was something that you could package and market, whether it's during wartime to make those Sanka cards, you know, or piss people off in the times for not naming pilots, you know, you know, <laughs> Pilot X and everything like that, not naming James McCudden and Albert Ball. Two, in the interwar period, you're like, I need a likable character. Let's do a fighter pilot and have those characteristics that they chose upon from the war and I, I, I going back to a point that you were making about was there one that a kind of sort of challenged or kind of made us think differently about this pilot was i think lord flashheart <laughs> uh, from black Squad- squadron commander the lord flashheart yes squadron commander the lord flashheart for it to be a comedy and for him to be a despicable human being I think it's the best way of challenging these tropes because it's recognizing it that we have made the flying ace a trope. And I mean, he's narcissistic, he's sexist, he's promiscuous, but he's doing it as a joke. It's not doing it to be serious. And I, I could talk about Flashheart for a long time, but I feel as if Flashheart's character for that crux of being late 80s, early 90s does the best job of reflecting back on kind of these toxic traits or very romanticized, generalized traits that we applied to pilots at a time when they're dying off en masse. Mm -hmm. And they are no longer here to be like, I, you know, I don't sign off on this, for lack of a better term. And And of course, that episode of Blackadder reuses a whole chunk of flying from Aces High which mm-hmm. always, always, always made me happy because there's my film and there's Blackadder arguing about sandwiches with Baldrick and somehow in an SE5, which, you know. And you know, it's, and it's other people outside the Flying Aces world that are making fun of him mm-hmm. and being like, this guy is awful. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it, for it to be a comedy, it's a masterpiece in critiquing the stereotype for comedy. And that's what, what comedy does best. So, Abby, we have a couple questions from one of our fabulous damn castiers over on Patreon. Karen's fired a couple at you, so brace yourself. You're ready for this? Okay. 
Her first question was, is the framing of the fighter pilot a similar figure in German popular culture between the wars? Do they do a similar sort of thing in the sort of aftermath of Richthofen and, and Udet and people like that? Not to my knowledge, at least in film, the, mm. the pilot is kind of missing in German made films. If, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's about yeah. German made interwar films. Yes. The ace is missing but interestingly the german ace is a is a common star in british made films of the interwar <laughs> period so like the germans aren't reflecting on the pilot their own pilots and films they're chosen choosing to look at the suffering and anonymous death on the the western front but nothing really about the aces and I don't know if a part of that is so many of their aces go to America to do barnstorming. So they're like, I'll just go see them in person. <laughs> I can do that. Um, but it's, it's, it's missing. And it's a bit of an odd chunk that's missing. You would have thought that this rather clean image would be the perfect thing for the early interwar years before the Nazis come around to, um, really show but a part of me wonders if that is the barnstorming that so many of them choose to go to the u.s to do barnstorming yeah pro probably most people had, had a beer with ernst do that <laughs> so they probably don't need to probably. go see a movie about it yeah. her second question is really interesting it is do you consider the interwar creation of the on-screen fighter pilot something that was a help or a hindrance to recruitment during the second world war and we did sort of mention this off camera, the, the test pilot aspect, which is another mm -hmm. film we, we didn't mention. Does Do these films funnel people towards the Air Corps and the Army Air Force? I think definitely that it is that in conjunction with the rise of popular magazines and children's magazines in the 20s and the 30s, you know, ones that kind of feed off of the the punch of the Victorian era where the focus was the empire and going to work for the empire. I think you see the pilot playing the same role for young children in the interwar period to where it's like, Hey kids, this could be you <laughs> minus the womanizing because you're 10. It's, it's this very attractive sort of job that you see with the Victorian era. And I think the interwar period and the late Victorian era kind of have some similarities in that regard as they're trying to prepare a new generation of, people that are going to serve one's respective nation in some way. And I think these films add a realistic nature that comics and, and books are missing and that they choose these very handsome, well-known actors to just show up as friends and they, you know, and, and hang out with people with, you know, some death and, and flying on the side, but to be like, look at the fun you could be having. Yep. And like even with films like Dawn Patrol, it's primarily doomed fatalism, but there is a level of humor and and horseplay that children can understand and be like, yeah, that could that could be a fun job. It's it's new, it's exciting, it's new technology. I definitely think these films play a role in lack of better term indoctrinating the youth that then go on to fly in the Second World War. It's something that they consume. It's what the Second World War then becomes after the post-World War II period, the pilot, that then overshadows its predecessor. It's You, you constantly see that replacing each other and inspiring people. It's like what Top Gun did to people that signed up after 9-11. So I definitely think it, it served to inspire children and, and people to then join up during the World War II Interesting point about that, that sort of circularity because R.C. Sheriff wrote the screenplay for The Downbusters, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So that, there's, there, there's, there's an interesting... See, bring it all full circle. Journey's end. Full circle. Hell's Angels, The Downbusters. Abby, this has been so much fun. We, 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 will, we will need to do a proper chat when your thesis is all out there in, in the open and things because that idea of space on, a, on an airfield, I think, is a fascinating way of looking at the psychology of a squadron um so we, we we will we will have you back if you'll come of course yes wonderful and thank you for this because this has been so much fun and i've just looked at the time <laughs> i'm so we, sorry <laughs> no 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 it's it's good because we get me talking about movies and then airplanes and you've really made me think a little bit different about some of 
some of the films we, we've talked about. And it's been a pleasure to be able to go back and watch them again. So thank you very much for agreeing to this and letting me watch some old movies and talk to you about them. And thank you for inviting me and sorry to talk your ear off. <laughs> no, trust me. I, I, when I saw what the time was, I thought we should really wrap up, but we could, we could keep going. I have more questions. Yes. Part two, ladies and gentlemen, we will, we will do it another day. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. And I honestly had no clue how long we've been chatting. So I'm going to keep this exit bit quick. Abby's fantastic. Please do give her a follow. Links in the description to her socials and also her articles and website, because I think that was a lot of fun. And there was a lot more that she's written about that we haven't really touched upon. So do check those out. If you want to pose questions to our guests, the way you can do that is by becoming a damn castier from just three pounds a month plus the VAT and you get stickers. And in January, you get keychains, ladies and gentlemen. Why wouldn't you want to join? They're just out of reach, so I'm not going to grab them. But yeah, all through January, there'll be keychains and a thank you card that could even be a Tempest thank you card, which I saw the other day and it is incredible. Check out the link in the description below for that. But we're going to have to have Abby back because there's so much more we can talk about. An hour and a half. <laughs> it's a lot of your time, but it flew by for us. And I hope you've enjoyed that chat. Pop us any questions into the description or ping us on social media and we will answer them as well. Like I said, we'll get Abby back and we'll talk about either her thesis or before then, maybe some more movie stuff because I like talking about movies and clearly so does she. As always, thank you to the fantastic Pima Air and Space Museum for everything that they do to help keep the lights on around here as well. So check them out as well. Another paper airplane derby coming up as well. So fantastic. Until next time, thank you so much for joining us. Do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.